Uh, welcome to our session. Uh, we're going to talk about um, Cisco, DevNet, uh, enabling applications. No slides, don't worry. Um, no marketing people, but three real CTOs had to tell you what we're doing, what is real, uh, and what the opportunity is. Uh, I want to position it a little bit in uh, Cisco's new focus, IoT, IOE, the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything. Um, if you go around our boots, uh, the world of solutions, uh, you will see a lot of examples. Um, it's uh, probably one of Cisco's uh, fastest growing business. By the way, my name is Wim Elfrink. Um, I'm an executive vice president, and since four years pushing IoT, IOE in the company. And I think uh, are we really coming to that tipping point uh, where it's breaking through and where it becomes mainstream. Uh, to give you a couple of examples on uh, specifically IoT, um, if you just look at the amount of sensors shipped, uh, that in 2012 it was around 4 billion, uh, 2013 it was 8, and we estimate 2014 uh, that 24 billion sensors have been shipped. It's becoming mainstream. An average car now, uh, high-end German cars, have 700 uh, sensors built in. Um, I was in Hamburg uh, the other week uh, in the harbor, and they have installed 10,000 of sensors uh, to track the ships, and that uh, they were able to, to dock the biggest container ship in the world. Uh, they were able to do a three-month simulation how to get the ship in. Uh, imagine it, it's a boat of uh, 19,000 containers. Um, if it has to slow down, it takes eight kilometers to slow down. And so you have to have tools uh, to do all these simulations. Um, coming back to IoT specifically, and uh, the things, uh, if we're here together for an hour, uh, around 300,000 things will be connected to the internet. And uh, that, that's the rate of adaptation on a global basis. And we estimate around 30 million devices being connected to the internet every hour. Uh, that is uh, around 30 million a week. And we estimate that by 2020, 50 billion things will be connected. Uh, that's fine. But everything that's going to be connected to the internet will light up and will start producing data. And that is, of course, uh, what it's all about. It, it's about, we call it the new gold, uh, the data. How can you transform the data information? How can you transform it in knowledge? And how can you basically transform it in wisdom and go to real-time decision-making? Um, and that's where uh, we see a uh, breakthrough at the moment in, uh, in applications. And when we started the Internet of Things seven years ago, it was very hard to monetize it. Uh, because you, you had all that data but you needed CIOs to start developing applications. And now uh, you see more and more open data. Entire cities like Chicago uh, who basically say um, the data is owned by the citizens. And it's coming up with data streams for developers. So if you look at total data traffic uh, on the internet, around 37% is now coming from industrial applications. And uh, from the things connected, the sensors, and that's moving quickly. We expect in the next two years that the industrial data will take over the consumer data in relevance. And so an enormous opportunity um, for application providers and application developers. Um, and we estimate that uh, in 2014, 120,000 new jobs were created um, by app developers specifically in the IoT, IOE space. So we want to discuss a little bit uh, about what we think from initially a technology point of view, at real CDOs, what are the opportunities that we see coming. Uh, but then in the next month and years to come, uh, Cisco will outline uh, much, much more also an uh, application platform pitch. Uh, where we will have real software on which you can platform, uh, software platforms, on which you can create applications. Um, we, we talk about, of course, the cloud, the intercloud, 
But we also start talking more and more on creating apps in the edge, that, that, that close at, to the grounds where you have video surveillance, and where you have, uh, for instance, in, uh, in substations, uh, in uh, smart grids, uh, not the need that everything goes to the cloud. So you can do a lot decentralized. And so we start calling that whole concept for computing, and where you have the physical world and where you can start positioning a digital overlay. Um, so I'm looking forward, at, I'll introduce the panel to you, and they will give an, uh, a, a small outline of their vision and what they see from a technology point of view coming in your, your direction. And then I should like to get questions from you. And what does it mean for apps development? What does it mean for CCIEs? Um, is the network becoming irrelevant or more relevant? Uh, what is the educational way to follow? So I should like to start with John sitting next to me here. And John has one of the most difficult names to, uh, to pronounce. So I'm going to give it a try again. Uh, John um, Apostolopoulos. Yes, excellent. OK, I passed the first test. <laughs> Thank you. And so John is uh, our CTO reporting to Dave Ward. Um, and you know, really looking at enterprise end to end. Um, and he oversees uh, all these uh, new fancy stuff like, of course, mobility, um, and like data center, um, like application centric infrastructure. And he's one of the leading CTOs to start thinking about the next generation of um, architectures. So John, what do you see coming from an IoT perspective, and it like data in motion, and it is going to be relevant for application developers? Yeah. So can you hear me? Does this work? A little bit closer to the mic. Excellent, yeah. great. So <clears throat> this is a really exciting time. Uh, as you remember, when the internet came about, there was a huge number of uh, new applications that arose that we never believed, that we never imagined. Same thing with mobile. The same thing's gonna happen with the Internet of Things, Internet of Everything. So we have a lot of, uh, uh, <coughs> we'll have a lot of amazing surprises that'll occur. To, ha to help identify these surprises and to help turn them into reality, what we're trying to do is work with customers, work with developers, to try to work with creative types and to see, hey, what can we do? What can we build? And, and to build that, what do we need to build it? What are the basic building blocks, the software, the hardware, the APIs? As developers, what do you need? What are the APIs that you need to help uh, create this amazing things? So that's what we're trying to do. And this is a very, uh, to us, it's an area we're incredibly excited about. And we're uh, investing heavily in DevNet and enabling the developer ecosystem with things like connected mobile experience, uh, which allows indoor location-based services for mobile devices, for things like the fog, and as Wim mentioned, this is an architectural principle to enable computation at the edge. So you'll still have cloud computing, you'll still have computing at the edge at endpoints, but in addition have computation, storage, and analytics at the edge. A concrete example of that is data in motion. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you, I believe, may have played with data in motion at the hackathon this weekend, and you can saw, you may have seen the great things you can do with it. If you didn't, I recommend to just go back here and talk with the uh, people who created it to learn more about it. Another thing we've done is to try to bring on board the tens of thousands of sensors and actuators mm -hmm. that people have developed over the years that today don't have an IP connection. They don't have Ethernet, they don't have uh, IP. But we've built some, uh, well, many of these sensors are on USB. So we've built a way mm -hmm. to connect mm -hmm. these USB sensors to the internet. So you can connect them to the cloud, you can reach out to them, mm -hmm. you can gather information, and you can actuate and so forth. This is going to be really powerful, we believe. Other areas we have been investing quite a bit include controllers to control uh, the infrastructure, to help control the end devices. Some of you may have seen the Open Daylight open source based controller, which, we're, which we've developed and is available on DevNet. Uh, Ken's going to talk about our work with OpenStack in, in a few minutes. And also, APIC EM is another uh, one of our enterprise controllers we've made available. And people are downloading the newest versions of it on DevNet today. So these are some of the things we're trying to do to enable the developer ecosystem uh, uh, so you can learn what we're building. You can teach us what else you need. And then by working together, we can, we can turn these amazing things into reality. 
And I'm happy to go into more detail about any of these topics. Okay, we will. Thank you, Ken. Um, thanks, uh, John. Uh, let, let's go to Ken. Ken uh, is looking as CTO to uh, our cloud business, InterCloud. Um, I think at the next uh, Cisco Live uh, in San Diego, uh, we'll have a lot of real examples. And uh, we're really on that edge uh, to get really concrete uh, with deliverables, examples. Um, you know, in my dreams, I think uh, three years out, uh, we start talking about a million, a million and a half developers at people, real people, at developing on our platforms. And it's the type of rate we're looking for. So Ken, what do you see coming? Uh, Ken, by the way, is an, a 20 year veteran in the industry. Um, you know, mostly when I really talk with him, I go home with a headache and to absorb it all and to be able to uh, get it in, uh, I would call it real world language. But Ken, what do you see coming as opportunities? Yeah, definitely. That, I think that's your polite way of telling me keep it brief because I could probably talk for <laughs> hours about this. Um, but the, the, I guess the two points I want to touch on, one is um, in the cloud environment, you're, you're always looking at ways to take data and make that data more valuable, right? And so a big part of what we're building with the Cisco Cloud is the, the data components and the virtualization components around the data to make um, getting access to your information easier and faster, right? And a lot of that information is going to be information being collected by sensors and devices that are part of the Internet of Things, right? Um, it's, a, it's a vertical focus of our cloud, and I call it a vertical focus because it's, it's still an evolving um, market as we know. Um, What's really interesting about that from an open source standpoint is our internal systems were in OpenStack clouds were, were huge contributors to OpenStack. And within OpenStack, we're contributing a lot to the data components and the data virtualization components. So there's a big focus in our teams on contributing data and contributing the way you analyze data and you process data back into the OpenStack community. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is very relevant um, with DevNet is the developers, right? And we are trying to provide that platform um, at the application and the developer-centric models that allow you to develop applications for the Internet of Things. So um, today, and if you go downstairs to the world of solutions, you'll see something like EnergyWise, which is an energy management solution. All of the management that they provide their customers is being hosted in our cloud today. Um, there's also a connected mobility exchange, which is a very similar model also where you have um, its uh, wireless access points that get deployed inside of a data center or inside of, of a, a, a sports venue in New York, for instance. But all of the management of those access points and all the, the IoT information that's being collected is we're able to make decisions in real time to mo you know, move connections to other access points to free up the bandwidth in a certain area, if there's a very hot area within a, within a sports venue. And so those are some, just a couple of examples. There's a lot of other things that we're doing to really enable developers to take advantage of the data um, without having to be connected or being local to that infrastructure. They can use the FOG environment and the cloud environment to really manage and explore, explore ways to improve the performance of their users um, in real time. Thank you. So, you know, I, I try also to inject some, uh, some, some, some real-time stories of why we think that inflection point is so close. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, cities, smart cities. Uh, that in the world of solutions, uh, uh, we show smart parking, we show smart lighting. Uh, we, uh, the key enabler for a lot of these, uh, what we call citizen services, uh, what in itself is going to be a $3 trillion market and uh, a new revenue productivity improvement and new revenues, and that is what this opportunity is all about. Um, and the inflection point uh, is, and it sounds perhaps strange, but are going to be light poles. Light poles. Uh, if you think about it, in the next decade, four billion light poles are going to be changed from traditional lighting to LED lighting. Uh, but if you just see that this changing the light pole, uh, you can also look at it, um, and, and that we have invested uh, from a Cisco point of view in a number of startup companies and who start coming out with multi-sensor nodes that will be built in a light pole, and the light pole uh, will basically be 
the multi-sensor nodes had to create access, um, blanket Wi-Fi in a city, um, but also video surveillance, um, pollution measurements, and so the light pole will become the smartphone of the city. And that like on a smart pole, you can also make a call. Uh, the light pole, you can also have a lamp. Uh, but if, if you think in these type of opportunities, and uh, it's coming, a city like Chicago is going to change 400,000 light poles in the next coming years. Are you just going to do it traditionally, or are you see it as an opportunity uh, to get a complete new infrastructure uh, and you get a fantastic return on investment if you think about the services it can generate. A city like Barcelona, like Chicago, are marquee city for us, uh, where we show what citizen services are going to be. Uh, it's about smart parking, it is about smart uh, lighting, it's about uh, smart roads, smart stadiums. Um, so, a lot of opportunities. Ready for the next CTO? mentioned something about the light bulbs yeah, for a second. Yeah. Go the, ahead. the light bulb example is yeah. really, really interesting because yeah. what happens is we, we've all grown up with light bulbs, right? We don't think there's anything special. But as soon as we go to LED light bulbs, what happens is that the power required for an LED is so small, you can actually power it over an ethernet cable. So what that means is you can have, one, instead of having high voltage connecting all these things, which is dangerous and it's hard to put up, and then you have to have a second network to control it. You can have one cable to every light bulb that delivers power and control. And this light bulb can have a radio, as was mentioned, could have other sensors. And all of whatever is in that location is controlled by one cable that gives power and control and gives data and connects to the internet and so forth. So it's a really, it's a really great example. It's a really powerful example of the huge changes that can occur, even for things that have been around for 100 years and we've grown up with. So you think lighting, both also, also indoor is going to be power over the internet? Yes. How, long, are, how, how long away? Well, we're building it right now. Oh, okay. So no, <laughs> no further announcements. Yeah, so. Yeah. So, so we're, we're it's actually, uh, we're actually building it right now in various places. And building 10 is going to have an example yeah. of that yeah. in San Jose, California. By the way, building 10 is our head office in San Jose. And, and it's, uh, we'll have it built in and ready in the next coming months. Yes. It's exciting. A lot of new partnerships with industrial partners coming around. Uh, but think about from an app point of view uh, what you could do to further enlighten that and uh, come up with services. Okay, let me introduce our third CTO here, Sam. Sam, you know, it basically says responsible for Cisco mobility strategy in NFV, virtualization and orchestration. Yeah. What does that mean and how will you make the link to application developers. The word is tap. Okay, obviously you've got the joke, right? Turn the tap on. So, uh, Wim mentioned that uh, he gets a headache when he talks to Ken. That's because <laughs> Ken gives him information. Uh, the reason why John's so excited is because he has APIs, right? So my job is to turn on the tap so it feeds Ken and John. I need to be able to extend the network in a way which allows you guys to put even more sensors out there that interact with the system. That's what you can do with a mobile network, right? So think of it this way. Um, who's heard of the Google car? Go on, hands up. Who's heard of Google car? Yay. Who's heard of Tesla cars? Right? Okay, good. They're all instrumented. So we mentioned this. The car is instrumented, which means it's not beyond the wit of man to realize that that car can interact with the environment around it. So I need to be able to get information onto the car and off the car. That's what a mobile network does. The problem that we have is that the call models that Internet of Things has is different from traditional call models. So I need to have a way of segregating that data from all the other data and give it to Ken in a virtualized environment so he can stand things up, who gives it then to John in forms of APIs that are available to you guys, who then gives Wim a massive headache. So my job is to turn on the tap, not provide any paracetamol headache pills, but just generally let information flow. That's my job. So how can you translate it to how? applications? That, okay. Uh, that so service providers, uh, it's, it, it's, it's interaction. So part of an ecosystem, for any ecosystem to be successful, it requires people to be active in it. Right, so uh, I gather all of you will have mobile phones of one form or another. Right? So there's one interaction there with you and the service provider. Another interaction is between you and the car owner. 
or who built the car. Another interaction between you, the car owner, and the metropolitan area. These are all business transactions that can happen. If there's business transactions, then there's a reason for doing it. That's what will drive the innovation inside IoT, IOE. Okay, yeah. So start thinking about some questions, and while you do that, uh, I want to give you, you know, one or two other examples. Um, you know, I, I'm Dutch from birth. Uh, I'm from the city of Rotterdam. Um, my father was an, uh, an, an architect, an, a physical architect. And so I can still remember my youth when he was drawing the library, the airport, schools. And when I'm back in my home city, I see that. It, it's physically realized. And we, at Cisco, we will be more and more digital architects. And we'll be positioning an, a digital overlay on a physical infrastructure. And then you come up with all these new opportunities, the, the, the new services. Um, I think one of the most disruptive ones, uh, and it's the first uh, American company who has been able to unify Europe in a strike. And it was basically Uber. And it, think about it. And it, it's a company of four years old with a thousand employees, hardly any assets, and they are transforming a business, the taxi business end to end. Um, you can fight it, you can try to regulate it, and it, but it is something that customers like. It is something that their employees like. And because it's going to the sharing type of economy and that people can work when they want, how they want to work, how many hours. And it, it, it's a complete new paradigm shift. Another example of digitalization, and because that's basically what we are doing. And we start digitalizing uh, the, the world, the economies. And that's, uh, I, I was in, uh, in Hamburg, I, I said it in the, in, in the harbor port, uh, but also in the, in, in the hospital. And I asked the CEO of the hospital, and that was, has been your biggest innovation over the last five years. And he basically said to him, it, it was digitalization of x-rays. And, and if you think about it, photography has been totally digitized. And that I'm of the generation uh, who used film. And that I had a dark room with chemicals, and there's nobody. Nobody who does that. Perhaps it's an art or a hobby. Have a digital photography, both on the consumer side and on the business side, has been introduced and is there. And so I will see that there's these great examples that, without even realizing, it has happened. But the company who invented photography, Kodak, gone. It's dead. Bankrupt. And so if you look at all these opportunities that are coming, and that, uh, with all these monetization opportunities uh, via apps, and to monetize it, uh, you can be and we will be very disruptive. So anticipating that and, and then trying to look at the new world uh, is basically the example I wanted to give you. I have two boys, 15 and 18 years old, and they have only two statuses in life. They are asleep or online. And that when they went back to school, and my wife said, did you pick up your books? You should see, you should see that, that their face. Oh, mom, we have no books. Our curriculum is on the cloud. And, and you know, they use iPads, and it is bookless, whether you like it or not. And then, so we start getting these type of codes in the family room, you know, that uh, are we communicating via cell phones and apps, or? Are we having real conversations? Uh, and I'm a little bit traditional. If uh, we have uh, parties uh, for the kids, um, cell phones at the door. I, I don't want to have intruders in my privacy. Anyway, um, I, I want to open it up for, for, for some questions, feedback. Um, who has the first question? Uh, and don't tell me you have no questions. Who wants to get going? There we go. Can we have a uh, can we have a mic? <coughs> and you know, believe me, if you have one question, it's more to come. And don't be shy. Make it interactive. Ask your questions, please. If you consider the entire ecosystem for IoT and supporting all the use cases for IoT, what would you consider as being the weakest link today in the whole infrastructure? Where do we need more investments and innovation? Is it going to be still on the data acquisition, data storage, or more on the data mining, and how, how you make that data valuable? 
as of today, well, what would you? My bet, but John, your, your comment, I think it's security. And that's, uh, if, if you start concentrating at all these access points, uh, specifically in manufacturing, and uh, if you go to our world of solution and you see the concentration, uh, security is going to be a big issue. Did you want to make some comments on that? Clearly security is uh, critically important. And Cisco's invested hugely in, try in terms of trying to develop secure solutions uh, and also to help uh, focus the energies of the academic research community and the standardization bodies and so forth on the, on the security problems that exist in IoT. So you can get a lot of the brightest minds in the world working on it and trying to solve those problems. I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, Cisco also uh, um, fostered a sec security, an IoT security grand challenge where Cisco identified a variety of key problems in IoT and basically uh, had a competition where people made proposals to try to uh, solve these problems and there were prize money and so forth that was given to the winners. And all this was an effort to really focus attention on some of the key IoT security problems and get the top minds in the world working on it. Just, just to kind of add to that, I think um, in addition to security, a lot of these um, venues that IoT devices are going into don't have the network foundation to really support the bandwidth. Um, I, I remember from my earlier days in my career, um, we, we always said, you know, an OC3 would be big enough. You're never going to need more than that kind of bandwidth, right? And then we move to the next level. <laughs> OC48 is going to be big enough. You never need more than that, right? And, you know, in, in the, you know, Google Fiber in the U.S. is putting gigabit to the home, right? And that's still not enough, right? People want more than a gigabit to their home. And I still remember 512 and, you know, some of the 128 dial-up yeah. days, right? And so it's, I think bandwidth will continue to be a problem and the ability to connect, um, you know, the, your standard network models that you have in the enterprise will not fit this type of a model, right? And so I think there's still innovation to happen in how do you connect these devices together? How do you create a fog network, right? The fog is very nebulous in, by definition today, right? So how do you create these fog networks how do you connect fog networks together? Is there inter-fog networking, right? Do carriers create a fog you know, service offering to provide you a fog network, right? And so I think just the amount of data and how you process that data, they're all big problems. Securing that data, obviously problem number one. Getting the data out to be analyzed, problem number two. And then problem number three is there are no algorithms out there that will analyze the data in a way that you need to make decisions that are intelligent with, right? And so there's a huge area, and that's where I think DevNet comes into play a lot, is um, both from the hackathons where you're trying to learn how to write software to do the devices and the, to do the algorithms on the devices, but also from just beginning to create these new capabilities. Um, you know, spending some time in a sandbox and developing the software and looking at how you can leverage the software from these devices. I think that's a huge part of what um, Cisco is going to help with, you know, how do you develop the algorithms needed to really process the data. Yeah, there's a, I have a slightly different view. Uh, my view assumes success, right? So, okay, you can put data onto a system, you can extract data from a system, you can manipulate data, you can then produce a result. If you get a critical mass, you have the same problem that any computer scientist had at the beginning, which is rubbish in, rubbish out. Right? So a part of the utility of what you, you guys are going to have is making sure the information you get that you're processing on is honest information. It's good information. Because without that, you know, the rest of the stuff doesn't work very well. So when I stand back from the security element of it, and the ability to process it, ability to communicate it, I think that's one of the main problems that we will face. Making sure that whatever you're doing with this stuff is useful at the end of the day. Different view. Maybe I'll mention uh, one more point about the security. Some of you are security experts, and some of you want to work in the security space. What our intention is, for those of you who want to work in that, that's wonderful. But many of you just want to use the secure building blocks. And so what we're trying to do is work with the, with the community, the general community, to figure out what are the, uh, the, how we can build secure IoT solutions, and then make these building blocks available. 
have them incorporated in Linux and so forth so that people can leverage them, developers can leverage them without having to be experts in security. Okay. More questions? Please. Gentleman over there. How do you um, persuade companies to release their data? I mean, you're talking um, about some cities that are enlightened enough mm -hmm. to put the data in public domain, but there are already examples of companies that refuse to release data, and it's the combination of the public domain data and the private data that makes the outcomes interesting. So how do you go about persuading companies that it, to release their crown jewels, because that's what they see it as? That's an intriguing question. And and it's, um, I think you know, one of the big debates in society for the next coming years is going to be who owns the data. Uh, let, let me give you an example uh, in healthcare. Um, and it, uh, if you take a company like Medtronic, uh, they make uh, various products. One of them is a pacemaker. And so one of the big debates at the moment about who owns the data and who's allowed to monetize it is that, uh, of course, the patient who has the pacemaker will say, it's my data. It's about my body. Uh, but the supplier says, it's my device. And then you have the insurance company who will say, but I pay for it. And so lawyers are going to make a lot of money in the next coming years uh, to come up with policies, uh, regulations about who owns the data. I think cities um, who are progressing and more and more in New York, Chicago, as some cities in uh, Europe now start saying um, and that we will regulate the data, we will get the data, but then we will define data streams to open it up uh, to application developers um, uh, to really start building services on top of that. Uh, so I, I think it is going to be a competitive differentiator. Uh, whether you are an enterprise company, whether you are a government, and think about uh, in an aging population like we are here in Europe, an aging shrinking population, which cities can attract young people? And that Berlin is, is, is one of the centers, uh, that, that's where you see a lot of young people coming, uh, that you see uh, venture capitalists coming, uh, startup companies, and in our uh, innovation strategy, uh, what we're going to push out is innovation. And so we had this morning uh, a couple of folks talking about our innovation center in London. Uh, we have an innovation center in Berlin. We have an innovation center in Rio de Janeiro. We have an innovation center um, in, uh, as an example, Toronto. And it's specialized in light. Uh, but we uh, are and have at the moment seven innovation centers around the world. And we are extending that to 10. And then in 2016, uh, we want to have around 15. That is, of course, uh, like DevNet is an, a virtual organization, uh, but people will come together in these innovation centers, and not exclusively Cisco. It will be with our ecosystem of partners that you can see uh, downstairs in, in the world of uh, solutions. So. And that's so it will be more and more open-based, yeah. open-stack. So uh, Sam, go on. Uh, to yeah. what Wim's saying, to answer your question more directly, um, for people to release data, they've got to see a benefit to them in releasing it. Right? That's one part of it. Part of the hesitation of releasing data is maybe I expose too much information. So there's a policy element to that as well. Right? So in parallel with the innovation, I think you'll see a need to have policy-based exposure of information out of systems. People have to make a, a value judgment on what information they expose. But to Wim's point, when people see the need to mix and match, to innovate, then they'll see a natural means of benefiting themselves as well as other people. And then I think you'll see people exposing data far more often. I think just, just to kind of add, amplify that point a little bit more, I think that the two areas I look at here have to do with, the first one is how do you sort of provide that environment that people feel comfortable and are open to sharing information, right? And so part of it is a platform play where especially if you think about like the Cisco Cloud and what we're trying to do with, with the Internet of Things, we're providing you a platform where you can select what data you want to make public and what data needs to be private, right? So that's one half of the puzzle. 
The second half is your, is privacy and, and some of the, mm -hmm. the rules that every country is going to have. Being able to define to, to the point that you know, it's just made with the policy and, the, and creating those rules around which, what information can you release about a person or about an event. Um, those, bringing those two things together is part of what is going to be necessary for people to feel comfortable putting this data out in the public domain. Right? If, they, if you're able to put some assurances and even from a security standpoint, going back to that, block data leakage and block access to data, um, people are going to feel a lot more comfortable about getting you know, information in, that's being collected out into a public domain as long as they know that their information and their privacy isn't being violated. And so we're not there, obviously, today. I think there's still a lot of, you know, there's a lot of discussion that's needed around privacy, but I think we're getting to that point of having the discussion now, and people are kind of starting to say, I don't want this information about me out there, right? I don't, I want to, I don't want to, you know, like on my, the first thing I do when I get a, when I get a phone and my kids get a phone is I turn off the location services, because I don't want anyone to know where I am or my kids are, right? That's none of their business, right? And so, to your point, I have the same policy. When the phones, people come to my house, I don't let them use their phones to take pictures. I don't let them, like, do anything in my family area because it's, it does violate your privacy. And it's, people don't realize that, that they're giving up information all the time that is harmful to them and to the people around them. And so, we're getting better, and I think you'll see over time, over the next you know, 18, 24 months, you'll see a lot of, of um, algorithms and rules created and some policies around how do you keep your data sensitive and privacy, privacy concerns out of this public domain. I see a big future for an app and that uh, I should like to have in my house and probably a lot of you, uh, if people come in that they're not able to take pictures. So from a privacy point of view alone, and there is a big market and that to, to start enabling applications, and to activate, to not activate, and to filter, and that, that you can set your own policies in your own domain. Anyway, just any just, more questions? Just one real yeah, quick please, thing on that, please, just please. kind of funny. Yeah. My, um, yes. I travel a lot, and my yeah. kids are smarter than my wife now when it comes to electronics in the house, which, is, yeah. which makes her mad, but it's just the way kids are, as you know. Mm -hmm. And she was upset because they would turn on the TV when she was upstairs getting ready or she was off in the kitchen making something. And we have this rule that you don't get to watch TV on a school night. And so when I'm gone, they were just taking advantage of her not being as <laughs> around to like do things. And she's like, I want an app that would just make, let me just turn off the TV from anywhere. So, cause she, she has a job and so, and she's a doctor, so she doesn't get home until late. And so they're home from school at 3 o'clock. She won't get home until 7, 30, 8 o'clock at night sometimes. So that's four hours that they're just goofing off, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have cameras in the house so she can see what they're doing. And, and she wanted me to create an app that would allow her to remotely just kill the TV so they, they couldn't turn it on no matter what. And so I built, I took an ADT, we have a security system. I took a device that they provide. I wrote an app that would allow her from her phone to any time she wants just kill the power to that outlet. And there's no way they can get to the outlet because the TV is in front of it. And so I, I, I did this for her, and now she's like so happy because she can. This week while I'm here, she's told me she's had to kill the TV every day, and she loves she loves that power in her hand. So my Real next my next example. app is the phone app. I think the picture taking picture app. I'm gonna see if I can somehow block all the signals from taking pictures. I will pictures. be your angel investor. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any more questions or feedback? Otherwise, uh, you know, I want to close with a question to you. Um, do you think it's realistic that Cisco is going to be known in the market as one of the key enablers from a development point of view to generate apps, um, either in business, uh, and because there are a lot of enterprise companies uh, who want to develop apps on top of their network and their installed base. Um, that, of course, in the open market, at the startups, the application providers. Do you think it's, uh, it would be a realistic target to say that uh, three years from now, we would have three million app developers, either uh, in the consumer space, uh, in the enterprise space, service providers, uh, that all starting to look, of course, at platforms and, but, but can I see some hands who think that would be realistic? 
Okay. I hope you will join us and that you will be one of them. Thank you for attending. Any closing comments from you guys? Some call for actions or some other brilliant ideas? Uh, I think you might yeah? see apps to order. Because you know, Ken's quite skilled, people aren't. Mm -hmm. So apps to order might be something that you'll see appearing. John? One thing I'll recommend is if, if, if you haven't had a chance to go around the DevNet zone yeah. to see a lot of the demos being shown, I highly recommend it. A lot of great things uh, from CMX to data in motion to uh, uh, basically enterprise IoT and so forth, as well as in the world of solutions yeah. with uh, a connected train we have there yeah. that provides quite a few interesting ideas about what you can do, yeah. what yeah. future uh, uh, things will be like in the train. So I highly recommend to look at the the IoT, IOE things in the world solutions as well as here in DevNet. Thanks again for joining us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.